Hear now the readings first from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Hear this reading, the lection for Thanksgiving Day, beginning at the seventh verse of the eighth chapter. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig tree and pomegranates, a land of olives and honey, a land where you may eat your bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I am commanding you today, when you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks have multiplied and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness and arid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. He made water flow for you from a flint rock and fed you in the wilderness with manna that your ancestors did not know, to humble you and to test you, and in the end to do you good. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth so that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors as he is doing to this very day. And then turning over to the Gospels, hear this reading from St. Luke, the 17th chapter, the 11th through the 19th verses. On the way to Jerusalem... Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? Where are the other nine? Was none of them found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, to him, Get up, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And turning over to chapter 18, he also told this parable who, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of my income, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Truly, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. There is a story I like that comes out of the life of Kurt Vonnegut, the American novelist. 
And the story is that the year before Vonnegut's death in 2007, he was invited to give the commencement speech at the University of Wisconsin up in Madison. And in that speech, he told those gathered, those soon-to-be graduates, a story about his Uncle Alex. Uncle Alex, Vonnegut said to that group, lived a humble and a very decent life as an insurance salesman in Indianapolis, Indiana. And he was a, as pleasant a man as I have ever known. My uncle Alex, Vonnegut said, only had one complaint against other human beings. And he used to say it fairly often. The trouble with people, Uncle Alex would say, is so seldom do they notice when they are happy. Uh, Vonnegut went on to say, the one thing I noticed about Uncle Alex is not only did he say that, but he practiced noticing when he was happy. It was his custom, Vonnegut said, when we were at family gatherings, doing nothing in particular, maybe just having lemonade on the front porch at his Indianapolis home, or talking with the TV going about sports, or thinking about planning a fishing trip together. At those moments when we were doing nothing in particular, uh, Uncle Alex would be tempted to interrupt us, and he would frequently exclaim, you know, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. And Vonnegut told that story and then said to those would-be graduates at the University of Wisconsin, that's what I would say to you. Please follow my Uncle Alex's advice and notice when you're happy. Make time in your life to think out loud or at least say to yourself once in a while, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. And I think that's a great Thanksgiving story, don't you? I mean, what is this week about if not pausing for a time to remember what makes us happy and to say, you know, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. I mean, that's what Thanksgiving, to, it's still my favorite holiday. I don't know about you, but Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday because it still retains a kind of purity about it. I know that commercialism is encroaching and some stores are going to be open Thanksgiving to try to entice you to leave your company at the Thanksgiving table and don't pick up the dishes but run out and get some pre-Black Friday bargains. I hope you resist, but as holidays go, Thanksgiving still has this kind of purity about it. At least it's one of the purest ones we have left because it's cut and dried what's going to happen this Thursday. There's no gift exchange. There's no onslaught of pre-Thanksgiving parties we have to attend. You don't have to decorate your front steps in Thanksgiving lights and orange tinsel, though my neighbor lady down the street has done that. Uh, but you don't have to. It's not expected. All you got to do at Thanksgiving is sit down with people you love, eat together, Reflect on how good it is to be alive, despite how, you know, there are pro Lord knows, you look at the news, man, there are big pro ISIS, what a, the ISIS thing, the Ebola thing, I could go through this litany, you know them all. Despite all of that, here we still are. We live in a wonderful, loving, good community. We are in the greatest nation in the face of the earth. We live at a time when, despite our problems, we are multiply blessed by God. And Thursday's our day to sit down and just to say the Alex Vonnegut line. If this isn't nice, I don't know what is. So in preparation for today, I thought, what am I going to do for Thanksgiving? I want to do something different. And what I decided to do is try and experiment. I went to the concordance. Concordance is nothing more than just a glorified index of, Bible, of the Bible, just a great big index. And what I did is I conducted for myself a little private poll among the, who in the Gospels, my question was, were uh, people who returned to give thanks to God? Who were people of whom it was said that they gave thanks in some form or other? And so I looked through the concordance about that. I looked up, gave thanks, and, and the results of my research project surprised me a little bit. The first surprise was I had expected there would be a whole long list of people in the Gospels who came back to give thanks in some way or other, people of whom it was said in so many words they gave thanks. But um, I only found two. 
Uh, one was uh, the, the character you might have guessed if you knew the Bible, uh, if you know the Bible well, and, and it's the story of that leper. You know, the one leper out of ten who was the one who, when he was healed by Jesus, came back and threw himself at Jesus' feet and said thank you. And Luke, I noticed, can't help but add that one juicy detail. Now, he was a Samaritan. I mean, the, the Samaritans were, of course, the most hated of, uh, of ethnic groups of their day. And though he had become the star of the show, he was the one who touched Jesus' heart, literally, with this sincere gratitude and became a discussion point uh, to, to what a low return of, a rate of return the thank yous were at that moment. We're not 10 cleansed, only a 10% rate of return. We're not 10 cleansed, where are the other nine? Uh, and uh, as we read that, of course, we know the answer. Uh, the other nine were out enjoying their newfound health and well-being. They were uh, taking hold of life, overjoyed, presumably, that they no longer were going to be shunned from the community or stigmatized, and they were out there trying to reconnect with their families, I, I assume, and their friends, and to make the most of life, which in some ways is just like we tend to do when good fortune comes our way, you know. It's tempting to scold the, the nine lepers, and I know they are probably making an appearance in pulpits all over the country <laughs> this, this morning, uh, uh, preachers shaking their fingers at those nine lepers. Uh, but I have to say, don't you bet, one reason the church recorded this story one reason it uh, has lived so long in the history of the, the literature of Jesus' life and the church is because the church has the wisdom to know that far too often the other nine is us. I mean, that's the real truth of the matter. We, we have so much that enriches us, and, 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 and there's so much to take hold of that it's easy to forget how utterly dependent we are for just the basic sustenance of life, health and strength, the capacity to relate to others, how much we have benefited by the grace we had no share in creating. You know, think about the gifts that have come, uh, what our parents did for us or grandparents, uh, what our families and friends and, and even perfect strangers do for us now that we have no, no stake in at all. You know, uh, little things even, the courteous driver that lets us into the stream of traffic when we uh, could be left to sit there and wait, but who just waves us in. The, the, the farm worker who we don't know but who picks our produce, some field far away in Florida or California, and the truck driver who then hauls it up to the supermarket, and the smiling young man who puts it in my sack at Schnucks when I go get my produce on Tuesday. I mean, we so often are the other nine, aren't we? I mean, we just grab the bag and go on with life and, and walk past it all forgetting both the gift and, and the giver who makes it all possible. I saw in the news a couple weeks back, maybe you saw this too, Joshua Bell, you know that name, Joshua Bell, a very famous violinist, who performed in symphonies all over the world, a great soloist. He has just repeated a social experiment that he first tried five years ago. Uh, with the help of researchers from MIT, Joshua Bell took his $3.5 million Stradivarius violin. He's one of those people who can use a $3.5 million Stradivarius. He took that violin, and he, he dressed down in blue jeans and a flannel shirt and a baseball cap, and he walked up into the lobby of Grand Central Station in New York City, and he posed as a street musician and played for an hour just to see what would happen. The experiment was to see who would notice this grand beauty of classical music perfectly played when it's offered in a context you wouldn't expect to find it, you know, the, the train station rather than a concert hall. Uh, Bell had first done a similar experience, uh, experiment back in 2007. He did a free solo concert just that way in the lobby of the subway in downtown Washington, D.C. And MIT set up a little uh, 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 hidden camera to watch what would happen. Again, he was wearing jeans and a baseball cap, and he flopped the case of his violin open and just started to play the Bach Chaconne. It was just very dramatic, wonderful piece of music. And they recorded for the next hour what happened. And what happened was, the first experiment, one th over 1,100 people came through the doors. And of that, those 1,100, only four even turned to look over his way. 
And of those four people, only one person stopped, mesmerized by this wonderful piece of music, this great classical chaconne that he was playing. And finally, when that was over, it, uh, it, it, it turns out that she recognized who he was. She gratefully walks up and shakes his hand, and you can hear it on the video. It's, there's a YouTube of this. She says, you know, I, I saw you once at the Met in New York, and I can't believe I'm seeing you here. Thanks for what you do. And, and it was an experiment, the first one in Washington, of kind of mindfulness and noticing what's right in front of you. And so seldom people notice when they're happy, uh, as Vonnegut's uncle says. And now, last month, Bell did the same thing in the train station in New York, but the outcome was different. Uh, happily, uh, it, it, and he was very happy about it. He, no sooner did he start playing, it was right at the top of some escalators in the Grand Central Station lobby. He was playing at the top, and a woman was drawn by this music he was playing. It was Mendelssohn this time, according to the experiment. And you see this woman... Uh, walk over and see this, and she gets her smartphone out, uh, and, and she uh, sends a, a, a tweet or an Instagram to people, and then uh, quickly, four more came, and they get there, you see everybody's getting their smartphones out, and it wasn't but about a, a 15 minutes until it was just packed for this hour concert of Joshua Bell playing Mendelssohn, and they had an interview with him on PBS when it was done after this performance, and he said this, you know, I was worried based on what happened last time and was ready to be embarrassed that nobody would notice again. So this has far exceeded my expectations. What I was really impressed with, he said, is how important it was for me to have somebody acknowledge what I was doing. It really made my day, that's for sure. And when I think about that, I think about the response of Jesus and when the, with the leper that comes back, you know? It's important. If, if he was disappointed that the nine went on about their business and didn't notice, that one that came back really did gladden his heart, right? I mean, it made a difference. We don't think about our having, us having the capacity to gladden the heart of God. But certainly in that story, one of the things that comes back is, uh, we're not ten cleansed, this foreigner, the only one to come back. And then he says, go your way. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. Which I think is why that leper will forever be a welcome visitor in pulpits on Thanksgiving Sunday for, you know, 2,000 years hence. He is the one who, out of his love and out of that sense of absolute indebtedness to a God that, you know, beyond his capacity to repay, he simply did what he could do, and it gladdened the heart of God. That's person number one who said thanks. But as I mentioned, there were two people I found in my concordance of whom uh, it was written, they gave thanks. I rummaged around, and sure enough, it was also in Luke, I found those words I was looking for. Father, I thank thee, and then do you remember what comes next for this other character? Father, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, unjust adulterers, or this tax collector here. Not what I had in mind, <laughs> to be sure. A prayer that goes down, in, uh, the ugliest prayer in all the New Testament, certainly, you know, filled with smugness and superiority. All the things people say is wrong with religion, you find in that one. I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. No, certainly not like this tax collector. I would like to think I've never prayed that prayer, but. Uh, have you ever had that experience where you're driving on a snowy day and the, you're, in the, you're on the interstate and somebody just whizzes by you really fast and, you ha and then later you see them having skidded off into the ditch? <laughs> ever had I confess, I've prayed that prayer before. <laughs> oh, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. <laughs> Reckless, foolish, or this poor fellow here in his four-wheel drive. And I, I have to say, you know, it can happen, can it? It's possible for our Thanksgiving, good Thanksgiving impulses to kind of veer off the track and take a posture of self-congratulation and superiority. I mean, it's possible for our prayers of Thanksgiving to kind of say, I am grateful to God. You know, God, thank you for all that you've given, given me, but we both know you know, I've kind of earned it, you know, I, I, I'm 
a little more self-motivated, I'm a little more deserving, I'm a little more clever in how I've handled myself compared to so many people. So I thank thee for, I'm grateful for what I have, but you and I, we both kind of know. We both kind of know. I had it coming, I had it coming. <laughs> Don't you think that's why Jesus told that parable? I mean, just to remind the disciples, there's something kind of important, I think, about this, this in relationship to Thanksgiving. For Jesus, it's pretty clear, the, the, the starting place for being thankful is not about, you know, count your many blessings, see what God has done. It's not about what you've achieved or what you have, and it's certainly not about this kind of feeling that you, you had, kind of had it coming. God, oh, God's settled up for what you, you're owed because you've been industrious and harder working than everybody else. For Jesus, Thanksgiving doesn't start with any of that stuff at all. It's not about so much about counting your blessings. It starts and ends, Thanksgiving does, for Jesus with God, with a God who meets all of us with absolute unconditional love and mercy and forgiveness and second chances. I mean, who's the, who's the star of that prayer? Not the one who says, thanks that I'm not like other people are. The one who can't even look up to heaven, but beats his breast and says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I mean, that's the one, Jesus said, who went home justified and not the first. And uh, it's Jesus' kind of clear statement that what we're most thankful for is that we are children of that kind of a God who will give us another start freely and repeatedly and circle us in grace and set us back on the path again and call us to be the souls God made us to be. It's a thanksgiving that begins and ends in the realization that we are children of that kind of loving God. Uh, years ago, I had a clergy friend named Rod Wilmoth. Rod's passed away now, but uh, he liked to tell uh, a Thanksgiving story that I have long remembered. I used to see Rod. We went to the same seminary, and I would see him at the old home week back at the seminary. They'd have a week of lectures we'd go to. And I heard him tell this story more than once. Uh, the story is, Rod was a Midwesterner like me. He was up in Minnesota, uh, my counterpart up at uh, Hennepin Avenue Church in Minneapolis. And the story is this, that one Thanksgiving week, um, his church undertook a project where they uh, worked with a community agency and got the names of 10 families in their local neighborhood that they wanted to offer a free care package, a Thanksgiving care package as part of the church's mission that year. And some church volunteers gathered in the fellowship hall the night before Thanksgiving, and they filled up these boxes of food and gifts that they wanted to give these needy families Thanksgiving time. Ten boxes were put out on the tables of the fellowship hall, and, and they were dutifully uh, filled up, food and, and all kinds of uh, treats. Everything was going well, uh, and at the appointed time, the ten families arrived. They came into the fellowship hall. They had a little uh, cider and some cookies and just kind of a time to welcome them and visit with the volunteers, but these families were all there, along with church volunteers, getting ready to get their baskets and go home. All was going well until the unexpected happened. There was a knock at the door, and when they opened it, there was an 11th family. Their old dilapidated car was kind of smoking in the, in the parking lot, a father, mother, three small children, and they had heard through the grapevine that there was going to be some distribution that night, and they wondered if it was too late to get any help. And Wilma said, you know, we hadn't planned on that. We didn't think about anybody else showing up. We only had 10 boxes. And uh, all the families that were designated to get a box were there, literally in the room with us. And, and, and I, I said, well, come on in. Uh, we'll see what we can do. Uh, and not knowing what I'd find, I thought I'd go into the kitchen and see if I could scrounge some crackers or whatever we might have around. And uh, he said, I was uh, scratching my head, still wondering how I was going to make this come out, when without any prompting at all, one of the women, uh, who, uh, part of the 10 families, she already had her box in her arms, getting ready to leave. She went, walked back to the table, and she sat her box down, and then she reached under the table and pulled up an empty box and began to take food from her box and put it into the 11th box. And then he said, without any prompting at all, all the other families, all the other nine families, they came back, put their boxes on the table, and they quickly made from what they had, an 11th box. 
And he said, you know, our volunteers, we stood kind of in awe and delight seeing that happen. And uh, they, they, uh, they all prayed together, and then all those 11 families, uh, all those 11 families, out they went on their way. And, and Wilma said, you know, for me it was a spiritual moment that taught me something I needed to know, and I think about it every year. Thanksgiving is not about what's in the box. It's about what's in here. That's what I learned from it. And uh, that's, to me, our challenge and our opportunity this Thursday. You know, however plen plenteous or difficult this past year has been for you, you have the chance to be reminded that the true Thanksgiving is not about what's in the box. It's about what's in your heart. And to be grateful that you are who you are and that even more, God is who God is. You know, God's the one who will give you life and fill each day with new starts and second chances and give you life abundant. And for that, we give thanks. And if that's not nice, I don't know what is.